Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I've got good news and bad news for you, church. The good news is I timed my message for tonight. <laughs> and I was able to do it in 30 minutes. Now, you're telling me, preachers, you're telling me you've never done that. You know you have. The good news is when I timed it, I was able to do it in 30 minutes. The bad news is every time I've ever done that, it always took me twice as long. <laughs> so don't get your hopes up. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to go easy on you tonight. Hallelujah. I don't consider myself a camp meeting preacher. I don't consider myself a revivalist type preacher. Most of my career has been that of a pastor and a teacher. But I do believe that I have a message burning in my heart that the Pentecostal Free Will Baptist desperately needs to hear. And they need to hear it now. I sense an urgency in my spirit like never before that what God has put on my heart to talk to you about today is something that can't wait. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, the very last chapter of the Bible, some of the very last verses of the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. And here's what the Word of God says in verse 17. Revelation 22 and 17, the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Down in verse 20, he says, he who testifies to these things says, I'm coming soon. And John adds, amen, come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Four times in those couple of verses, we see the word come. I think the message is clear that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again. And I want to preach on that a little bit tonight for about 30 minutes, if you can believe that. I want to preach to you about the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I got a couple of reasons I want to preach on it. First of all, I want to preach on this subject because I don't hear a whole lot of people preaching about it these days. I mean, I hear a lot of sermons, and I listen to podcasts, and I listen to, 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 to YouTube streaming, and I love to listen to good preaching. I mean, I listen to bad preaching, but I really love to listen to good preaching. And I hear a lot of sermons about a lot of good subjects, but I don't hear a lot of pastors today opening their Bibles and teaching their Bible, teaching their congregation what God's Word says about the rapture of the church and the tribulation that follows and the second coming of Jesus Christ to earth again. So I want to preach about it tonight. And here's another reason I want to talk about this a little bit tonight is because when I do talk about this, whether I'm talking to an individual face-to-face -face or a group of people or even a congregation, when I talk about this subject, people look at me in one of two ways. They look at me like I'm crazy. Like, you mean to tell me there's a preacher that still believes that stuff? Yeah, here's a preacher who still believes that stuff. Or, or, or they look at me like they're disappointed because they hadn't got married yet or they hadn't got their driver's license yet or they hadn't raised their children yet or they hadn't built their career yet. Like, I want Jesus to come back, just don't want him to come back anytime soon. And I just don't see a lot of joy and excitement on the faces of the people of God today over the thought that Jesus Christ could rapture the church out of this building before we end this service tonight. So I want to preach about it a little bit tonight. Hey, here's another reason I want to preach about it is because when I look around and I get around uh, all over the nation and around the world, and I see lots of Christian folks these days, I see lots of church folks these days that don't live their lives like they believe that Jesus Christ could call us home at any moment. If we really believe that Jesus could rapture the church, I'm talking about tonight. If we really believed it, I believe we'd work a little harder. We'd pray a little longer. We'd jump a little higher. We'd give a little more generously. We'd serve with more enthusiasm. If we really believe that Jesus Christ was coming back to rapture the church. So I want to talk to you about the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you three things that Jesus is coming back to do. First of all, Jesus is coming back to rapture the church. I believe the rapture of the church is the next event on God's prophetic timetable, and it could happen at any moment. 
I believe there's coming a day when the father's going to lean over to the son and he's going to say, it's time. Go get your bride and bring her back to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And at that moment, and the father knows the time, at that moment, uh, gravity's going to lose hold and millions of people are going to disappear off of planet Earth. I'd love to listen to CNN the next morning. I'd love to listen to, 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 to Good Morning America the next morning when they try to explain what in the world happened to millions of people who disappeared the night before and where did all the babies go? <laughs> I'd love to hear how they explain all of that. He's coming back to rapture his church. The prophets of old foretold it. The prophets of old saw into the future, and they foretold things that only God would be able to do. They foretold, for example, Isaiah foretold that Israel would become a nation again. In Isaiah chapter 66, here's the way Isaiah said it. He said, can a nation be born in a day? Well, apparently the answer is yes, because Israel was born on May the 14th, 1948, and became a sovereign state, a bona fide nation, in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, of Isaiah chapter 66. Jeremiah prophesied that the children of Israel, the Jews, scattered all over the world because of their sin, that they would be drawn supernaturally back to Israel. And his prophecy couldn't be fulfilled unless Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled because there wasn't any Israel to come back to. And this is the fulfillment of God's prophetic word. The Jews, after 1948, began to trickle back to Jerusalem, back to Israel, and then it picked up a little bit. And long about the time COVID hit, they started coming in on the plane loads trying to get home to Israel. And then when Ukraine got attacked by Russia, they started coming even more from all over Africa. And Jews from all over the world are doing everything they can to get back to the homeland. And I believe before it's all over, he's going to have all of them back there. You know what? I read the other day on Google, and you know Google wouldn't lie. <laughs> I read that there are only 16 million Jews in the world. Think about that. That's not a lot of people. Only 16 million Jews in the world. Seven million of them currently are living in Israel. Another five and a half million live in the United States of America. Most of those live in New York. And the other million and a half or so of the Jews in the world are scattered all over the world. And I believe before this thing's over, he's going to get every one of them back to Israel because he's got a meeting with them. And the prophets foretold, they foretold that Israel would become a nation. They foretold that the Jews from all over the world would make their way back to their homeland. You know what else they foretold? Isaiah foretold that that wilderness, that desert, that dust bowl in the last days before the Lord's return, that it would become an oasis in the wilderness, lush and green and beautiful. And it has happened in our lifetime. And, and what that tells me is, is that Jesus is coming back to earth again. So, so the prophets foretold it, but what's this? The New Testament writers described it. Why, well, you read passages like Matthew chapter 24, uh, Luke chapter 21, over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you read those verses where they talk about what life's going to be like right before the end times, right before Jesus raptures the church and the tribulation begins. You read those verses, and it describes exactly what we're living today in the United States of America. Unprecedented lawlessness, blatant wickedness, gross immorality, and it's all around us, and it tells me one thing, that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again. He's coming back to rapture his church. The apostle Paul wrote about it to the Thessalonians and he wrote like this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and he said the Lord God himself shall descend from the clouds with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. He said the dead in Christ are going to rise first and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. There's the word caught up in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm about ready to get caught up. Are you like, 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 like Enoch over in Genesis chapter 5. You remember Enoch? How that he walked with God and the Bible says he was not because God took him. He was caught up. Or like Elijah when him and Elisha were walking along the Jordan River. And all of a sudden a chariot came down out of heaven. A chariot of fire. And he was caught up. 
Or like Jesus in Acts chapter 1 when he's saying goodbye to his disciples and the Bible says all of a sudden he ascended into the air and disappeared in the clouds. He was caught up. Or like John the Revelator in Revelation chapter 4 when he saw an open door into heaven and all of a sudden in the spirit he's in the holy place, uh, in the worship place uh, and he sees the four and twenty elders uh, and the saints worshiping the King of kings and Lord of lords. Caught up. And I believe we're soon going to be caught up. Jesus is coming back to rapture his church. I'll tell you something else he's coming back to do. He's coming back to settle the sin issue. I don't know about you, but I hate sin. The older I get, the longer I serve him, the more I hate sin. I hate what sin does to families. I hate what it does to men. I hate what it's doing to marriages. I hate what it's doing to a whole generation of young people that are being engulfed by the clutches of the devil. I hate what sin is doing in our public schools, and I hate what it's doing in the White House. I hate sin. But Jesus is coming back to deal with sin. <laughs> and there's a period called seven years of tribulation where he's going to deal with a sin issue. He's going to deal with a rebellious, sinful world. John described it like this in John chapter 6 and verse 2 through 8. He's on the island of Patmos. He sees a vision of the future, and he's told to write down the things that he sees. And, and it, it's, it's what we know today is the book of Revelation. And the first thing he saw there in Revelation chapter 6, the very first thing he saw was four horses galloping across the canopy of society. And the first horse, he said, was a white horse. And, and, and I believe the rider on that white horse is none other than the Antichrist. And the, the, and the symbolism behind that white horse, I, I put the word deception. Because he's going to come and he's going to deceive many. And it says that he's going to be given crowns. There are going to be ten kingdoms, ten nations that are going to hand over their power to the Antichrist. He comes with a bow, but the Bible says he doesn't say he has an arrow. The reason he doesn't have any arrows for his bow is because he's not coming on this white horse to, fight, to make war. He's coming to make peace. And he's going to be a smooth character. He's going to be slick. He's going to be charismatic. He's going to be persuasive. He's going to be powerful. And on top of all that, he's going to be demon-possessed. And the Bible says he's going to deceive many people. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 24. In fact, you ought to do it sometime. I don't have time tonight because i got to preach this message in 30 minutes. But you ought to do it sometime. Do a comparison between Revelation chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 24. And everything that John saw in those four horses, Jesus told his disciples about it in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus, what's the signs of your coming in the end of the age? And the very first thing he gave them, first sign he gave them, here's what he said. See to it that no one deceives you. A little bit later on, guess what he said? He said many false Christs and many false prophets are going to come and they're going to, watch this, deceive many. And there's going to be a lot of deception and people are going to be deceived by this guy. And they're going to think he's the answer to all their problems and he's going to, to, he's going to figure out how to solve things that, that the world's been grappling with for years. And, and, so, and so it's going to be a time of deception. And so first of all, John saw a white horse. And then, then it said after that, John saw a, a red horse. And this is symbolic of war. Because shortly after the Antichrist establishes his kingdom over these ten nations... I have an idea which ten nations they are, but I'm not going to preach it because I can't prove it. But there's ten countries that are going to give their power, going to give their authority to the Antichrist, and he's going to lead them. But just as soon as he gets rolling, the other nations of the world are going to start coming after him. And he's going to be fighting wars on every side. It's going to be a time of much war. In fact, in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4, it says that it was permitted to him to take peace away. Now, this is the guy who comes on the scene at the beginning of the tribulation and brings peace, but it's a false peace. It's a fleeting peace. And here he is turned around, and he now has the authority to take peace away, and there's going to be war breaking out all over the world. Jesus described it like this. In Matthew 24, he's talking to his disciples, and here's what Jesus said to them. He said, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of war. You're going to see nation rising against nation and kingdom rising against kingdom. That's what's coming during the tribulation. Jesus prophesied it right there. And we see this going on right now. I mean, I was in South Korea 
I was in South Korea just this past year for the World Pentecostal Fellowship, and we went to the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, between South Korea and North Korea and had a prayer rally. Thousands of spirit-filled believers crying out to God, praying in the spirit for God to touch Kim Jong-un and the crazy people of North Korea who are just bent on destroying their brothers and sisters in South Korea. And, and, and then Ta there's China ju just threatening to invade Taiwan. Russia's invaded Ukraine, and it seems like they want to take on all of NATO. We're told that Iran can't wait to get their hands on a nuclear bomb so they can annihilate Israel. It seems like the whole world is sitting on a powder keg just waiting to explode. Wars and rumors of wars. John saw a vision. He saw a white horse indicating deception. He saw a red horse right behind it indicating war. Then he saw a black horse indicating famine and financial collapse or economic collapse. Revelation 6, 5 says the rider of the horse had a pair of scales in his hands. Watch this. And he cried out saying, a loaf of wheat bread and three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. In other words, it's going to be a time of famine and it's going to be a time of economic collapse. All those wars are going to take its toll on the nations of the world. We're hearing threats of famine right now just because of the war between Russia and Ukraine, aren't we? Think what it's going to be during the tribulation. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 24 and verse 7. He said there will be famines, but he added to it. He said there will also be pestilence. You know pestilence is another word for pandemics. <laughs> I hate to break, break the news to you all, but there's more coming. <laughs> well, for those that are going to be here, it ain't going to be for me, but there's more coming. Famines and pestilence and, 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 and earthquakes in many places. John saw a vision of a white horse, deception. He saw a vision of a red horse, war. He saw a vision of a black horse, death uh, and, and economic collapse. And then he saw a vision of a pale horse. And this one re represents death and destruction. Notice what John says in verse 8 about this horse. It says, and he was given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beast of the earth. And again, Jesus addresses this one in Matthew 24 and verse 9. He said this. He said, they'll deliver you up and you will be killed. Now, he's talking to the, the disciples. He's talking to Jews about Jewish events during the tribulation. It has nothing to do with church. Okay? And so, so, but here's what he says. He says, if those days had not been shortened, no human would survive. Think about that. If those days had not been shortened, no human on earth would survive. And, and listen, church. That's just a description of the first four seals. <laughs> you that have read your Bible, you've read Re Revelation chapter 4 through 19. You know that there were seven seals, and with the opening of each seal, there's a new round of judgment poured out. And then after those seven seals, there, 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 there's, there's, a, there's seven trumpets that are blown, and, and, and with each of those trumpets that are blown, there's a new round of judgment that's poured out, and it gets worse every time. And after the seven trumpets, the, the, there's seven bowls of the wrath of God that are poured out, and they get worse with every single one. And throughout that period, it is Jesus dealing with the sin issue. And it will be, listen, it will be the just wrath of a holy God against a rebellious and sinful people. He's coming back to rapture the church. He's coming back to deal with the sin issue. And I, I want to end on the first night of camp meeting on a, on a positive note. So let me tell you the good news. He's coming back to establish his kingdom on this earth. At the end of the tribulation, Revelation chapter 19, you want to get happy, read about halfway down that 19th chapter. When Jesus comes back in the clouds riding on a white horse and the saints, that's us, with him on white horses. And he comes to the Valley of Jezreel, otherwise known as the Valley of Megiddo, the place of the Battle of Armageddon. Ghetto, get it? So he comes back to that valley and the Bible says that all of the nations of the world will assemble there for war. Many scholars believe that they've been drawn there by demonic spirits, drawn there for this last battle, drawn there perhaps to attack Israel for one last time. And in the midst of all of that is all the nations of the world that have rebelled against Jesus are about to, to go to war. All of a sudden here comes Jesus on a white horse. And the Bible says he had flame in, in his eyes and a sword in his mouth. And what that means is with the power of his word, he would destroy all of his enemies. And all he had to do was <sighs> and annihilate all of them. 
And then the best part of all is when he takes old Satan, Lucifer, the dragon, <laughs> the snake, and he puts a chain around his neck and he hands the chain to an angel and says, take out the trash. <laughs> Woo! And he cast him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Won't it be something to live on planet Earth during the millennium for a thousand years with no devil, no Satan, no demons, no evil? And then the best part of all, he's going to go to Jerusalem and set up his headquarters. And he's going to reign and rule over the earth. It'll be heaven on earth. And we're going to be there with him. It'll be wonderful. You know, the Old Testament prophets wrote about this. You ought to read your Old Testament. I'm concerned a lot of Christians uh, enjoy the New Testament, but they get stuck in the weeds in the Old Testament. And uh, the Lord, I'm going to just tell you this. The Lord put it on my heart a while ago. I shouldn't tell this. <clears throat> but the Lord put it on my heart in my prayer time one day. He said, uh, he said don't you buy another Bible. All right, preacher. I know there's a lot of preachers here tonight. He said, don't you buy another Bible until you read and mark every Bible on your shelf. I said, yes, sir. Here's what the Lord impressed on me. He said, I want you to get all your Bibles. And you know, preacher, we've all got way too many Bibles. He said, I want you to get all your Bibles and decide which ones you're going to read. And, and so they're in some different translations. There's two or three translations that I, I enjoy reading. Uh, I don't have any problem with them. There's, there's plenty I do have problems with, but there's a couple I'm, I, I, I'm, I feel safe with. But anyway, he uh, said, I want you to read them and mark them. Every time I read a Bible, I mark it. I can't read without marking. And when I get done with it, you'll know it's been read through. He said, I want you to read them and mark them from Genesis to Revelation. And then once you've read one and marked it, I want you to give it to one of your children or one of their spouses and I thought the Lord was done talking. I figured, Lord, I better get reading. And then the Lord said, get this, and one of your grandchildren. That's where he had me, Hazel. That's where he had me. I mean, I got three kids. They're all grown and married, so three plus, you know, that's six. So that's six Bibles I got to read. And I got five grandchildren. Can I, is it okay? And the sixth one is on the way. Woo! Three, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eight. I got to read 12 Bibles before the rapture or before I die. And since January, I've read three. I'm on my fourth Bible. <laughs> I've been, I, what I'm telling you is I've been getting in the Word like never before. I've been at this, 40, I've been at this 40, almost 43 years, but I'm getting in the Word like never before. And the more I eat, the more I want. The more I read, I can't stop reading. I just love his word. And, and getting back in the Old Testament has been just food to my soul. And one of the things that it has taught me reading the Old Testament, it has taught me about how God is, how God looks at sin, how God looks at people, how God deals with people. And it's just reminded me a lot about who God is. But here's something else I found in reading the Old Testament. Is when you get over there in those prophetic books, those prophets talk probably as much about the millennial reign as anything else. I mean, they, told, they talked all about the millennial reign. I was reading it the other day. I said, you know what? I'm going I'm to tell them over at the tabernacle Sunday night in case you ain't read it in a while. I'm going to tell you what the prophet said life is going to be like right here in Dunn, North Carolina, right here on planet Earth during the millennial reign because it could be about seven years away. And I mean that with all my heart. And the first thing they tell us is, watch this, it's going to be marked by holiness and godliness. It's going to be marked by holiness and godliness. Habakkuk said it like this. He said, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord. Won't that be a place to live, church? The Bible says that every one of us, at least once a year, are going to go up to Jerusalem to worship Jesus in his headquarters in Jerusalem. Some of you have been on Holy Land trips, and you paid four to $5,000 for a Holy Land trip. In the millennium, we'll be able to go for free. My daddy used to, used to say that we won't even have to buy a plane ticket. We can just think it, and we'll be in Jerusalem. <laughs> won't that be something? It's going to be a, a, a time of holiness and godliness. Here, here's another one. It, during the millennium, right here on earth, during the millennium, it's going to be a time marked by peace and safety. I, Isaiah said it like this. He said the people will beat their swords into plowshares. They're going to quit fighting and go to farming. <laughs> 
said they'll, they'll, they'll turn their spears into, into pruning hooks. And it's going to be a time of peace like this world has never seen. Here's another one. The prophets told us that it'll be a time marked by health and wholeness. Here's what the Bible says. It says, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame men will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute shall shout for joy. Hallelujah. That's what it's going to be like in the millennium. And then, what's this? It's going to be a time marked by productivity and prosperity. Yeah, Amos said it like this. He used a farming analogy. Amos said it like this. He said, in that day, the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes shall overtake him who sows the seed. That's talking about the productivity during that time on earth, the millennium. And then, you know what? For you animal lovers, and I know a lot of you love your pets, it's going to be a time marked by calm within the animal kingdom. The Old Testament prophets told us that in the millennium, the lion is going to lay down with the lamb. Said the leopard will sit down beside the goat. Said little children will sit down beside a snake hole and play with the cobra. And there's numerous verses that talk about that. You know what I read the other day? Said the, the, the lion will no longer eat meat. They'll eat grass like a cow. The carnivorous animals will become herbivorous, I think it is, <laughs> herbivorous, and they'll, they'll start eating grass because they're not going to kill each other anymore. It's going to be a time of just perfect, perfect peace, even in the animal kingdom. And, and, and then here, here's another one, and, and I know some of you are going to love this because I know how concerned, uh, and I'm serious, I know how concerned some of you are about global warming. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but it's going to be a time marked by positive change in the environment. Jesus is going to solve the problem of uh, global warming. Sometimes I have to chuckle when I hear our authorities in our own government talk about saving the planet, and I think, my Lord, they can't even save the post office. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> but Jesus is going to straighten it all out. Isaiah said he's going to make us a whole new heaven and earth. We ruined this one. We messed this one up. He's going to give us another chance, and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. What I'm telling you, church, is Jesus is coming back to earth again. He's coming back to rapture his church. He's coming back to settle the sin issue, and he's coming back to establish his kingdom on earth. Well, you say, Randy, if all this is true and it's imminent, it could happen at any moment, how are we supposed to respond to that? Well, I'll, I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you how. How do you respond? First of all, get saved. If you're here tonight in an audience this size, it could be that you're here and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior. I like to say it like this. If you can't tell me the time and the place that you got saved, you probably didn't. So if you're not saved, get saved. You might say, well, I'm going to wait and see if all this stuff you're talking about happens. And if it does, then I'll get saved during the tribulation. And you could do that. You, you could do that. I wouldn't advise it, but you could do that. Uh, there'll be a lot of people getting saved during the tribulation. I believe one of the greatest re evangelistic revivals in the history of the world is going to happen during the tribulation. Uh, and, and it won't be the church that pulls it off. We won't be here. Uh, we've had our chance, and we haven't done too, too, too good a job with it. But, but he's got a plan. He's got a plan. And I believe there's going to be millions that are going to put their faith in Jesus Christ dur during the tribulation. He's, he's got two Old Testament witnesses sitting off in the wings, and they're just waiting for the chance to come down to earth. And I don't know if it's going to be Moses and Elijah. I don't know if Enoch's going to be one of them. Dr. Preston Heath is going to be preaching night at the, uh, the, on Tuesday night, and he is our resident expert on the subject of end time and prophecy. He can probably tell you exactly who it is. But I, I, I sort of have my ideas about who it might be, but there's two Old Testament characters that are just waiting in the wings, and, and, and when, when Jesus says it, at, during the tribulation, they're going to come down to earth, and they're going to show up in Jerusalem. Maybe they're going to stand by the wailing wall, I don't know, and they're going to preach, the Bible says, for 1,260 days, and they're going to have fire that's going to come out of them and destroy anybody that tries to stop them from preaching, and they're going to preach the gospel, and many people are going to hear it and respond to Jesus Christ. But, but Jesus has got another plan because he's going to save 144,000 Jewish men, 12,000 from each tribe, and they're going to go forth as flaming evangelists anointed by God with a protective seal in their forehead so the Antichrist couldn't kill them if he wanted to. And they're not going to die until Jesus says they can die, and they're going to preach the gospel, and millions are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ. But he's not finished. He's got another plan. 
The Bible says he's got an angelic messenger that he's going to send to just fly all over the world to the four corners, uh, to the most remote places. I've been to some of those remote places where they don't even have electricity. And they're going to preach the gospel in the clouds, in the air, and people are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ. So there'll be a lot of people getting saved during the tribulation. And you can wait if you want to. But a lot of those people that get saved in the tribulation will also die in the tribulation. And the Bible talks a lot about them having their heads cut off, being hunted down by evil people who hate Christians. And those that don't take the mark of the beast, they're going to starve to death anyway. And so, yeah, you can wait. But I'd recommend if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus is your Savior, get saved. Here's, here's another one. Live sanctified. Get saved if you're not saved. And if you are saved, live sanctified. Start living a life that is marked by purity and holiness. Some of you wonder what I'm... I, I have a scrolling thing on my tablet when I preach, and sometimes I just have to tell it to stop. I need to talk a minute. Forget the 30-minute thing now. I'm concerned. I mean, I get around. I get around churches all over the country, around the world. I get around PFWB churches. And I'm concerned at the number of people in God's house who look like the world, dress like the world, act like the world, think like the world. Listen, we're not supposed to blend in. We're supposed to stick out. We're a peculiar people. <laughs> We're a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood. Start acting like it. Let's live sanctified. He's coming back for a bride without spot or blemish. So if you're here tonight and you're not saved, get saved. If you are saved, live like you're sanctified. And then here, here, here's another one is stay informed. Just, just stay informed. Uh, Jesus reprimanded the people, the religious leaders of his day because they could not determine the times they were in. He reprimanded them in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 1 because they could not d d determine the time at which Jesus would appear. They should have known that he was among them and they missed it. They were clueless. I believe if Jesus came back to earth today, he'd have to reprimand some pastors and some teachers who are clueless about how close we are to the end of this world. You need to start listening to more than CNN and MSNBC. If all you do is look at the news, CNN, all you'll hear about is the Kardashians. <laughs> you know what? I don't even know who they are. <laughs> Honest to God, I could not tell you if they are athletes or singers or movie stars or comedians. <laughs> Randy, who are no, Never mind. <laughs> Chairman of the Ministerial Council. <laughs> Former superintendent, do you know who the, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I don't even know who, I don't know who they are or what they do, but everybody talks about them. If all you do is look at Fox News, uh-oh, now he's quit preaching and going to meddling. Now listen to me, PFWB, I don't listen to much news anymore. Now when I do listen to it, it'll be Fox News. <laughs> That's just me. But I about got tired of them too. Uh, if you want to know about Hunter Biden's laptop, listen to Fox News. They'll tell you about that. Let me tell you something, people of God. You better start reading your Bible to find out what's going on. We better get back in the Word and find. Listen, some of us act like we still believe the United States is the center of the world and everything revolves around us. That ship has long since sailed. No, no, no. In the last days leading up to the end times, which is where I believe we are, the action is going to be in Jerusalem. The action is going to be in Israel. The places that matter are going to be those nations around Israel. That's where you better start looking. So we need to stay informed. Do you know, I'm ashamed I didn't know this until just a year or so ago. Anybody ever heard of the doomsday clock? Well, you one up on me. I just heard about it a couple of years ago. Apparently, back in the days of Albert Einstein, I'm told that it's about 70-some years ago, the nuclear physicist and atomic scientist got together and started studying the climate of the world and they came up with this symbolic or fictional clock called the Doomsday Clock. And they have gauged on that clock year after year for 70-some years how close we are to midnight. And midnight is 
boom. Midnight is when everybody starts pushing their red buttons, you know, their footballs, and, and the whole world, everybody blows up everybody. And do you know, before COVID, they had set the doomsday clock. I kid you not, these are not preachers. These are not spiritual people. These are some of the smartest scientists in the world. Looking at everything going on in the world, they had set the doomsday clock at about 15 minutes to midnight. Then COVID hit, 10 minutes to midnight. Then Russia attacked Ukraine, five minutes to midnight. And now it seems like everybody and their brothers trying to get nuclear warheads. And you know that, do you know that in their last meeting just recently, these brilliant people, because of all that's going on in the world, they have, they have set the clock, the doomsday clock, at 60 seconds till midnight. And again, they don't, they don't have any prophetic agenda here. They're just saying that this world is about to explode, that it's like a time bomb just waiting to go off. You need to be informed. If you've got some spare time this, this week, here's what you can do. Go and Google, what's that guy's name? Klaus Schwab. Any of you seen that character? The founder and president of the World Economic Forum. And every year in Davao, Switzerland, he brings the most powerful and the wealthiest people in the world together for a week-long meeting. And I'm talking about wealthy like Bill Gates, wealthy, who's there every time. I'm talking about powerful like John Kerry and other senators who are there in Duval, Duval, Duval Switzerland every year. And they've got a platform, and they've got some agendas, agendas like figuring out how, how to come up with a one-world government, how to come up with a one-world economy, how to come up with a one-world medical system and a one-world military. Do you know where this is going? And they are commissioning these powerful and wealthy billionaires to go back to their own nations all over the world and influence the people who can make this kind of thing happen. And while you're Googling old Klaus Schwartz, Google his spiritual sidekick, Yuval Noah Harari, an avowed atheist, a Jewish atheist, who's right there alongside of old Klaus, and he's getting up some steam, and he's doing speaking engagements all over the world and writing books, and I'm seeing him pop up everywhere, and he never misses an opportunity to lamb blast the Christians and ridicule our God. Just a few weeks ago, uh, Yuval Noah Harari said that this new chat GPT, this AI, artificial intelligence, y'all heard of chat GPT? I posted on Facebook the other day, you better forget about chat GPT and start chatting with G-O-D. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's what you Harari said. He said it won't be but a few more months until chat GPT will be able to write a new Bible for the world. Here's what he said, a Bible that is true, not like the fairy tale fictional Bible of the Christians and all the other holy books that have been written through the years. You better get informed. While you're at it, y'all, some of y'all wish not hit this thing again so to start scrolling. <laughs> While you're at it, Google the United Nations because in September... I think it's the 17th, 18th, and 19th. They're going to have their 77th General Assembly, and the Secretary General of the United Nations has sent out, and they're not hiding this stuff. You can go to the World Economic Forum's website and read about all these agendas they've got for the world. You can go to the United Nations. The Secretary General has put it. He's got 17 things that he wants the world to accomplish, and it's just like it's, it's that whole one world stuff. And, and here's what he said. 15 years ago, the United, about 190-some nations signed this, that they were going to work hard to, 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 to establish these 17, and when you look at them, it's written right from the pages of the book of Revelation, these 17 uh, accomplishments for the world. And, and it said the other day, he's put it on, on the UN website, said, uh, at this coming assembly, September 17th, 18th, and 19th, we're going to call on the nations of the world to confirm the covenant. Hmm. Horace, I don't have time to go to Daniel 9 tonight, do I? <laughs> you know where I'm going, don't you? Uh, they've already got the covenant. It's 15, it's seven years ago. He said, we're not getting it done. And he said, we're going to call on the nations of the world, 
it's, it's the, Brother Preston, it's the weekend after, it's the weekend after the leadership conference at Pigeon Forge, so at least we'll get to go to Pigeon Forge one more time. <laughs> but the week after, they're going to call on the nations of the world to reaffirm their commitment and turn up the steam so that we can accomplish these 17 platforms, what's what, well, here's what he said, in the next seven years. Yeah, yeah. What am I telling you? Am I telling you that Jesus is going to rapture the church middle of September? I don't know. It may be another 20 years, but it sure seems plausible, don't it? He's coming back. He's coming back to rapture his church. He's coming back to settle the sin issue. He's coming back to establish his kingdom on this earth. So if you're not saved, get saved. If you're saved, get sanctified. Live sanctified. Stay informed. And I'll close with this one. Be busy. Be busy. Start using your one and only life to do something worthwhile for the Lord. Discover your purpose. I like to say it like this. If you've got a pulse, and as I look across this auditorium tonight, I'd say at least 90% of you look like you've got a pulse. No, oh, no, no. no. You, all, you all look like you're still with me. If you've got a pulse, God's got a purpose. If you ain't dead, God ain't done. Find out what he left you here for and start doing it. Get busy. Be busy when the Lord comes back. Amen? I want to close with this as the team comes. I was reading over in the book of 1 Corinthians the other day. Got to the last chapter, chapter 16. Almost the last verse, right down at the very end of that great letter to the Corinthian church. And as Jesus, as, as Paul is making his final farewell statements, he injects a little word. The word in the original language was in Aramaic was Maranatha. Maranatha. And in the English translation, it's not a word, it's a phrase. It, 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 it means come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And it just sticks it in there. In the middle of those closing remarks, he just says, Maranatha. And somehow it stuck. And we're told that in the early days of the church, the early Christians embraced that word as a greeting when they would see each other on the streets, instead of saying shalom, peace, they would say maranatha, and they knew what it meant. When persecution broke out, and, and they had to start meeting for worship in secret behind closed doors, that they, 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 would, they, would, they would use this word to gain entrance into the caves and the hiding places for their secret worship services, and they'd say maranatha, and they knew it was okay to let them in. At the end of those services, in hiding during persecution, at the end of those services, they, 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 would, they would say goodbye, they would embrace, and they didn't know if they would see each other again because of persecution. And they'd whisper in one another's ears, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. When they were being tortured and martyred, we're told by the historians that wicked Emperor Nero would capture Christians and cover them in animal skins or blood and turn them into an arena so the spectators could watch as wild animals ripped them to pieces. And the historians have written that with their dying breath, they would lift their voices say Maranatha come Lord Jesus one historian notes that Nero used to hold great festivals at his palace and he would take Christians and affix them on poles like crucified and cover them in flammable substance and set them on fire line the walkway to his palace human torches the saints of God and again the historians say with their dying breath 
amidst all the screaming, with their dying breath, they could be heard to say, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. It became their encouragement. It became their motivation. It became their hope. And I believe we're about to face some days, church, where we better get us a word and we better hang on to it because it might get tough. And I think Maranatha is a pretty good word. Stand with me if you would. I thought a lot, prayed a lot about how to end tonight. First, I want to do this. If you would, just bow your head. And I'd just like to know if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you'd quickly slip up a hand, I just need to know. I just need to know. I want to pray for you. Maybe we're all saved here tonight. Praise the Lord. That's all right. I believe what I'd like to do tonight to begin this camp meeting is to just open this altar and just encourage any who will, ministers, pastors, some of our new candidates, new ministers, all of you folks, anybody that would like to. What if we just did a practice run tonight? I mean, if I read the Bible correctly, when we get up there, we're going to be around the throne worshiping the, the Lamb. And they've been worshiping Him for thousands of years. They've got some practice on us. What if tonight was a practice night for them? And if we just, as the team leads us in worship, what if we just came and spent a little time around this altar tonight and asked God to pour out his blessings on the PFWB and ask God to bless this camp meeting and ask God to show us what to do with our lives till Jesus comes because Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again. Can you give Jesus a clap offering tonight? As they sing, let's come on and worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless your name, we bless your name, Lord. We worship you, King, we worship you, Lord.